Hello YouTube. As the name of the channel indicates, I am staunchly opposed to steroid use, both for health reasons, of course, but also because even from a spiritual standpoint, I believe that every single reason that might push a man to take PEDs is deep down misguided. That being said, it doesn't mean that I don't understand the reasons that might motivate people to take PEDs, because I've been tempted in the past. I perfectly get that some of these motivations are valid and we're all going to face them at one point or the other of our life. And this is the reason why I think that pushing away these temptations by just pretending they don't exist is actually counterproductive because it's not going to help you in any way the day you become able to potentially jump on drugs because you'll have spent so much time denying to yourself your desires that when you finally have the chance to get them fulfilled, you will not be able to resist. So I think it is super important to actually look at these reasons logically. And to do that, paradoxically, the most efficient way is to take a dive within the psyche of someone who is doing drugs, listening to someone who was able to stay natural through sheer willpower might be very motivating, but it's not going to give you the tools to resist the temptation. Whereas someone who succumbed to the temptation most likely embodies all of the characteristics and the traits, the behavioral traits that you might possess as well. And that down the line will be your demise because these are the reasons why you will eventually jump on drugs. And so if you're looking for a PED user who possesses the type of mindset that makes people renounce the natural way, you really have two paths. Either you can look for real humans on YouTube fitness, for example, but I think it's not a good choice because most of these types tend to be deeply delusional and they're not even honest with themselves. So they won't be honest with you. I think the only real example I have of someone who was fully open was Rich Piana and sadly he is dead. Um, so the other way would be to look at fictional characters because fictional characters have no reason to lie to you. They don't actually exist. And this is why weirdly someone like Jack Anma from the manga Grappler Baki is one of my role models because he's one such example of a man who took PEDs, went to the dark side, but did this for reasons that are perfectly understandable and therefore also allowed me as a young man to resist the temptation. So weirdly, in order for us to stay natural, we're going to have to take a long hard look at Jack, a character whose defining trait is the fact that he's on a lot of juice. But that's only at the surface level because Deep down, his drug use is the result of an environment. It is the result of a deeply traumatic past and really of a host of mental health issues that are extreme, of course, and hyperbolic in the story of Baki, but that we can all relate to to some level. So by paying attention to his mistakes and the mindset that led to these mistakes, I hope that we can avoid repeating them ourselves. And that's exactly what we'll be doing today. So this is a new philosophical breakdown of one of my favorite mangas. We're going to be discussing stuff like body dysmorphia, feelings of inadequacies, masculinity, brotherhood, and self-destructive behaviors. So even if you've never read Baki or you have no idea who Jack Anma is, you'll still get something from this philosophical segment. But because I understand that some of you are out of the loop, I'm going to quickly introduce the character of Jack. So Jack Anma was born in a set of circumstances that are not enviable at all because he is a rape baby, meaning that his mom was raped by a man named Yujiro and he was then born in prison. So here we have someone who pretty much has no luck whatsoever in life. Apparently, he's not getting the love from the dad that he never knew. His mom was suffering dearly from the trauma of the rape, of course, so no love from there either. And from what we know, he grew up pretty much alone. Every single thing that could have went wrong, went wrong. And that already filled him with a lot of rage, but also a lot of hatred for life. And that is a very important trait I want you to keep in mind because 
This is what trauma does to people. The pain of the trauma is one thing. The relationship that is going to create for you going forward with life is another because you're going to start to look at life as something dangerous and something that owes you something because you were never given the good things in life. Life for you has been nothing but hardship and hurt. And so naturally you're going to start to think that this is the nature of existence itself, that it is only pain. That is not true. But if you believe it is, then it will become true. And that's exactly what happens to Jack because he had pretty much bought into the notion that life had no value. And when you think that life has no value, you quickly start to just waste it away or worse, you engage in behaviors that are extremely dangerous and might lead to your death because what exactly is death to someone who doesn't enjoy a life? And this also immediately connects to drug use because most times the people who do drugs are not happy people. They're not confident people. They're not people with good lives. There are usually individuals who are seeking drugs as a mean of escapism, as a way to numb their pain, or as a way to numb their psyche, to forget about their trauma and to forget about their past. And storage users are no exception. I know that PD users like to put themselves in a different category. They don't like to think of themselves as junkies, and I understand why. No one wants that stigma. But if you look at their psychological portraits most of the time, these are not people who are well adjusted and well aligned with society. Sometimes they can be, but there's always something deep down that motivates taking drugs. It is too simplistic to pretend that it's only for muscles. There is always an underlying cause because at the end of the day, we all want muscles. I want muscles too, but I'm not on steroids. Why? Because that little push, that little pocket of darkness or trauma that would motivate me to jump on drugs isn't there. And so in truth, if you want a society where drug use is reduced to nothingness, the easiest way to accomplish that is not to ban drugs or to make it illegal. It's to find a way to create an environment where people have no reasons whatsoever to take drugs. So if you can fix the problem of unhappiness or the issues of confidence within the young lifters, most likely you should also be able to fix the current storied crisis. Because now the void that the drug was utilized to fill is no longer there and so the drug has no use anymore. But with Jack, this wasn't the case. The drug had a use because the void was immense. Actually, the void was the only thing in Jack's life. We see very small snippets of his existence outside of the gym. And what we see is a man by himself who lives in a rundown building with no friends or family who's just cold, alone and hungry. He has nothing going on in his life. When you have a fulfilling existence, passions and people to spend these passions with, in reality, doing drugs is not even on the menu because what for? But if you have nothing going on, like most junkies and most drug abusers, then the drug becomes your life because it becomes the only thing in your life that can bring you even a small sense of joy or fulfillment. But in this case, it would be untrue to claim that Jack was tempted by steroids because of escapism. Actually, it's quite the opposite. For him, steroids serve to fulfill a purpose and that purpose is revenge. Jack is a creature of revenge. He didn't care about living for his own sake. He only wanted to actually fight and kill a certain man. And that certain man, if you know Baki, is of course Yujiro Anma, who is the person who raped and was responsible for the death of his mom. So since Yujiro was in Jack's head responsible for all of his problems, and I don't disagree with that, by taking revenge on Yujiro, in a metaphorical sense, Jack was attempting to take revenge on his own life because he was going to get rid of the person that robbed him of his happiness, which, as I just said, is idiotic because just because you take care of the person that hurt you in the past doesn't undo the hurt. You're still hurt. You hurt someone else, and maybe that's a good thing because now this person will not be able to hurt other people. But as for your own trauma, it did absolutely nothing. And this is where the distinction between Baki and Jack occurs. Because you might have noticed that Baki went through the exact same thing. Baki was mis uh, misused, in a sense, yes, because he was treated as an item and abused by his dad his entire life. His dad killed several of his friends. His dad killed his mom. So for Baki, Yujiro is also the person who caused all of his misery. But the difference is that 
once back he realized, because he lost, that killing Yujiro was not going to solve his problems or trauma or depression, then he took a different path altogether. So, and this is something I discussed in a previous installment you can find in the description, Yujiro is in a sense the dragon of chaos. He is the chaos that introduces itself in the life of man, creates turmoil, trauma, destruction and death, and gives you a choice. It motivates you to get things done, either to push away the chaos, to fight it, to try and defeat it, or to find a way out of the chaos, to create order and to create structure. And this is where the choice, and I insist on the word choice, is so important. Baki decided to create and to live life when faced with the dragon of chaos, he refused to become chaos itself, and Jack did the exact opposite. Jack embraced the chaos, he became the chaos because he saw it as the only way out of his shitty life. Which in a sense means that Baki took a righteous path, a life affirming path where he would try to find a parallel existence where he does not have to die in order to establish himself as a man. And Jack did the exact opposite where he accepted that the death of Yujiro and his potential death at the hand of Yujiro was the only way forward for him. So it's a life denying decision because that's not actually living. But we'll get back to this dichotomy later because it is extremely interesting. So to get back to Jack and his predicament, Jack had decided that the only way forward was revenge. And to get revenge, you need strength. But the paradox of Jack's situation, I guess, is that he was extremely weak. He was born with a very skinny body and he was incapable of putting on muscle. So the project or prospect of defeating Yujiro was completely out of the question. It was impossible for him. Or at least that's what Jack believes. But from what we see, because we have an outside perspective on this situation, we know that most likely he is responsible for that body. Jack was not born skinny. The reason why he was not able to grow stronger is because he didn't eat enough. And also, more importantly, he trained way too much. He refused to actually rest, recover and grow bigger. It is his obsession with revenge that guaranteed that his revenge would never occur. And this is true in Baki. It's also true in real life. Often, when you meet a man that tells you that he cannot build muscle, there's usually nothing wrong with his body or with, with his hormonal profile. Usually, it's that the methods that this person uses to get the body to grow are simply not adapted. It's the method that's corrupted, not the body. It is extremely rare for someone to be an actual non-responder. I know it's a big thing going around. It's a thing because people latch onto it as an excuse to explain why their results suck. The body is designed to grow bigger and stronger. That's literally what your muscles are coded to do. It is a nonsensical conclusion to believe that for some reason you are born with the type of muscles that are not able to strengthen themselves. But then what these people will do is they'll use that as a justification to jump on TRT, which is really just drug use. Then they'll see a result. And because they saw result like this, they will then convince themselves that it was the only way out because they are finally big. This actually proves nothing. It doesn't prove that you needed drugs to get there. It only proves that it's easier to get there with drugs even if your methods absolutely suck. But the viciousness of that, that psycho and that, that mindset is that once you have renounced the natural path and you have accepted that drugs are your only way out, you now become dependent on drugs for the rest of your life. And it's exactly what happens to Jack. So Jack was a typical skinny kid who underheats and under recover and trains like a complete asshole, which in truth is the only way to overtrain. It has now become more popular to call about to call overtraining under recovering. And I like it because as someone who trains a lot and hard, I can tell you that I couldn't really overtrain even if I tried because my recovery is always on point. However, if you are very skinny and weak and you have no work capacity, it's very, very easy to overtrain if you're too eager. Something that one of the character, one of his trainer, who tells the scientist that eventually gives Jack steroids that Jack would be better off flirting with girls and going to a restaurant or a coffee shop 
and he'd actually put on more muscle that way than if he trained. It sounds hyperbolic, but it's true. Recovery periods can be more important than your training periods if your training periods are way too dense and way too intense. But this is a reality that Jack was apparently incapable of perceiving because of the intense hatred he had for his own body. And that hatred was born, one, from the conditions that gave birth to his body, because we have to remember that he is the son of Yujiro, so there's something to it. He is, in a sense, part of Yujiro, so the fact that he detests the body that he got from his dad is logical. We see that with Baki as well. But there's also the fact that Jack has body dysmorphia, and he has a very severe case of body dysmorphia, where he cannot stand to have such a skinny body because it's not aligned with his goals and with the inner image he has for himself, which leads him to overtrain, which keeps him skinny, which makes the body dysmorphia worse, and it's just a downward spiral. And I can tell you, because I've been in that spiral, that it's real. My spiral was called bulking because I always was a small kid. I was always obsessed with getting bigger. And so the second I started bulking and I realized how easy it was to get bigger, but not more muscular via bulking, I lost control of myself. And I just went up and went up and went up. And the more I went up in weight, the more I spiraled because the worse my body dysmorphia got. So in a sense, body dysmorphia can be directly responsible for your stagnation or plateaus in the gym because they lead you to follow methods or practices that are counterproductive because they're too aggressive, which leads to your muscles and strength regressing in performance, which then makes you want to double down on the method. And as I just explained, this is when you start to spiral. And this is why body dysmorphia is such a bitch. The more body dysmorphic you are, the more you tend to become body dysmorphic because you lose rationality. Right? You're emotion-driven, you're suffering from the dysmorphia, so you're trying to find any way out of the dysmorphia, but these means tend to be very short-sighted, and so they only make it worse. And that's something I want to insist on, because a lot of people wrongly assume that the way out of body dysmorphia is to just meet the demands of the dysmorphia. So the dysmorphia tells you get bigger and you think, oh, well, if I just obey it and I get bigger, it will go away. But you understand that it doesn't work like that. It's like giving in to blackmail. If someone blackmails you and you pay them, you just sign yourself a life of blackmail because that person now knows that they can get whatever they want from you if they just continue with the same means. And that's fucked up to realize because your body dysmorphia is you. It's created by your own brain. But sadly, as we see times and times again with mental disorders, your own brain can become your worst enemy if you let it. And this mistake, this false approach to dysmorphia, is usually caused by the fact that people look at this disorder as a form of end goal game, in the sense that, as I said, they believe that if they can match the image in their head, then it will go away. What they don't understand, however, is that just like any mental disorder, the disorder evolves with you, and the desires associated with the disorders grow as the disorders evolve and as you feed the disorder. So, as a bodybuilder, the more you chase that size that you think is going to make you happy, the bigger the dysmorphia gets, the more it demands from you and the more size you have to put on to now meet the new standards, and the more it's going to escalate because you're going to keep chasing the dragon. That is exactly what chasing the dragon is. It's thinking that you will be able to stop there and finally be happy, but it will never actually occur because as you get closer to the dragon, the dragon is fleeing away from you. It's like trying to chase a rainbow. Yeah, sure, I can see the rainbow from, from my window, but if I try to find where the rainbow meets the ground, it will never actually happen. This is why the entire legend about the pot of gold down the rainbow is actually a very good metaphor for chasing the dragon. You think you'll find gold there, but the only thing you'll find is your own delusions. And this is why taking drugs to fix your dysmorphia, like I've seen so many bodybuilders attempt, is actually the worst thing you can do because now you are going to accelerate that process. You are going to feed into the disorder faster and you're going to help it grow bigger. And before you know it, it's going to take over your life because 
the desire that you feed rules your life. I'm certain it's something that you've heard. You have two wolves inside you. Which one wins? The one you feed. It's the same with temptations and desires. We are all men and we are all equal in that. We are all tempted. That is perfectly normal. And the demonization of desires is dangerous because it's going to make you blind to their power. You have to understand where they come from and you have to understand how to deal with them. But blindly giving in to them thinking that once you do it's going to be all better is stupid. The nature of desire is that it can never be quenched or fulfilled. Life is a constant quest to access things you desire. But if your life becomes only that, then it's not going to be worth living at all because you're just going to be stuck in a circle of desire, pain, and it's endless. So what the wise man does is that he only feeds his desires moderately and he decides which ones he starves. The problem is that naturally mental disorders make this much more difficult. And I must make it clear. I'm not stating that to shit on people with BDD because body dysmorphic disorder is not fun. I've dealt with that myself at a very low level and yeah, it is a bitch because when your brain tells you that you look like shit and that you're small, no amount of reality check is going to help you. So I perfectly get that there are people who are going to fall into extreme means to try and get rid of that pain, a pain that I understand very little about. I'm just there to tell you that it is not a solution, but also that the people who downplay the pain are assholes. Just because you might not be afflicted by body dysmorphic disorder does not mean it doesn't exist. It would be like if I claimed that depression wasn't a thing because I'm not depressed. No, I'm just lucky I don't have to deal with this shit. But some people are. The question is, how do we get these people out? Well, as I said, blindly accepting the demands of the disorder instead of fighting the urge is not the way to go. But that was the mistake that Jack made. Jack completely gave into his body dysmorphia and he started taking as much drug as possible. And the more he took, the bigger he got, the stronger he got, the more he wanted to take, etc, etc. Because there is no such thing as one cycle. I'll say it once and I'll say it again. All these kids who think, oh, one or two cycles and I'm done. You are lying to yourself. The second you get a taste of what it means to get on cycle and you see the results and you see the sensations and the confidence, you are going to be hooked for life. I have met and talked with many PD users over the years and they all told me the same thing. Once you train on PEDs, you can never go back to training naturally because it's going to feel like shit. You have experienced what it means to be a god, to have transcended humanity. And you think you're going to be satisfied with being an average Joe again? Nope, not possible. Why? Because once the brain tastes a desire that is up here, it can never go back down. Men and women, humans in general, cannot go back on a standard. So the solution is do not establish an unnatural standard that you can never touch without drugs. Because if you do, just like Jack, now you are going to be a slave to drugs for the rest of your existence. And once you do that, you enter what I call a life denying cycle. Because you embrace the suffering and struggle of human existence, which is fine and is absolutely necessary if you want to be better, but you do it for the wrong reasons and therefore you also use the wrong methods, which down the line means that you're going to just throw your life away. And this is something that if you've read back here, you know, because in the first arc, every single character that comes into contact with Jack says the same thing to him. They all constantly remark that he's on steroids and he's wasting his life away. And that's not innocent. Baki is very heavy on symbolism because the story of Baki focuses mainly on overcoming obstacles to become the best person possible. But you also will have noticed that the only person in the entire story who does PEDs is Jack. Yujiro is not on PEDs. Biscuit Oliva is not on PEDs, even though he is bigger than Jack. Canonically, he is natural. And that's for a reason. Some people might say, well, it's silly, it makes no sense. No, it makes sense. It's because the story only needs one PD user to get the message across that this person is the only person in the story who's not doing things right. And of course, 
other characters also represent that. So Biscuit Oliva, for example, when he is fighting with Baki, it's another cl ideological clash because Oliva is attached to the concept of freedom to the point that he has stopped to realize that he is no longer free. That is the lesson behind it. Likewise with Jack. Jack fought for his existence by taking PEDs, trying to take revenge, but he never realized that by doing so in reality, he just embraced death. And that might not appear super important because in the story of Baki, every character is willing to fight to the death. So what difference does it make? Well, the difference is the path towards the goal. Every other character in Baki got their physique and strength via training via hard work alone. This is said times and times again. Shit, the character of Baki is the character, all mangas included, that spends the most time training. 25% to 30% of the time you see him in the panels or on screen, he's training his body. There is a lesson in this. It's called environmental narration. It's trying to tell you something. That to get bigger and stronger, the means Baki employs is training and training alone. Whereas, what do you see Jack do? Yes, yeah, sure, he trains, but he also can be seen taking pills, drinking vials, and injecting train directly into his fucking neck. You know who you also see train all the time? Oliva, Dopo, Yujiro, every other character is doing it the right way. So, in the context of this, we can say that Jack is written as an anti-hero because he's an example of what not to do. And that should be enough, right? It should be enough so that young men would see it and immediately think, okay, the backy way is the right way and the Jack way is the wrong way. But we also both know that this is not the case because Jack is immensely popular. And he's immensely popular because that type of life-denying behavior is inherently super cool. Young men don't relate super well to goody two-shoes or saints. Yujiro is popular because he's a badass. Even though he's a rapist, he's still beloved. Look at Guts. Yeah, Guts has all of these redeeming qualities. He also has pathological traits that make him a monster. Doesn't stop him from being most likely one of the most beloved characters. You know who no one fucking likes? Takemichi. I don't know if you've watched Tokyo Revengers. I started watching it recently. Holy fuck is that kid annoying. I want to strangle him through the fucking screen. You know who I love in Tokyo Revengers? Draken, Mikey. Because even though they're total fucking sociopaths, they also have these traits on the side that make them relatable. Most times, if a character is 100% goodness, no one likes the dude. If he's 80% darkness, 20% goodness, now we like him because he's relatable and he has also these characteristics that we might have in us that we know are not the best to have, but they're still there. And so it feels good to see someone who embraces them because it's like a mirror. It allows us to learn more about ourselves. And this is what makes Jack a very good role model despite the fact that the guy pins trend. Where it becomes an issue, however, and something that I've seen with Guts, for example, is when the fans, who are usually young men, try to romanticize these negative traits, where they no longer see them as negative. And this is the issue, as I said, with life-denying tendencies. Oftentimes, because they're associated with masculinity, young men disregard the fact that they might be toxic because they want to embody them. And this is why the comparison between Baki and Jack is so pertinent. Because Baki is also beloved by fans and young men want to emulate him. So, by looking at what they did differently, we can pinpoint the things that you need to focus on in your life so as to make sure you don't end up like Jack. And to do that, we have to start with their goals because they're literally the same. They both want to become the strongest fighter for one reason, to be able to defeat Yujiro. But the path they took to it is entirely different. And this is where the diverging mindsets emerge. Because as I said, Baki went through the same trauma as Jack did, but instead of becoming like Yujiro, he instead chose to embrace a life-affirming philosophy, meaning that he accepted all of the hardship that life had to offer, but he refused to become hard himself. Just because the universe is cruel does not mean that you have to become cruel. That is the concept known as amor fati, the love of one's fate. 
to never become embittered by the fact that your existence might not have been as easy as you would have wanted and to make sure that once you surpass this difficulty, you become a positive impact in the life of others. So, Baki was a kind kid who became mean and cruel because he believed that this was his only way to defeat Yujiro, who then realized that by doing that, he was losing the battle. The true victory was to stay kind and to stay true to who he was. And this is where Jack went astray in my opinion, because he also faced similar hardships, but instead of trying to stay strong and to not let himself be defined by the hardship, he just leaned into it entirely and he became cruel. And by becoming cruel, he allowed his father Yujiro to define him. So at the end, Yujiro won. And this is why when you look at the end of Jack's arc in the at the start of Baki, the last time you see him, he gets trampled by Yujiro. He gets punched into the ground. Why? It's a lesson. The lesson is trying to face the dragon of chaos by becoming chaos yourself isn't gonna work. You cannot out chaos chaos. The only way out is order and it is Baki that represents that order. And if I were to give you an example that's less symbolical and that you can relate to, bullying functions the same way. There are a ton of people who get bullied and who then become bullies themselves. And they're doing the exact same thing I just described. They let the bullies win because now you're just as cruel as them. If you have went through the hardship that is bullying, you should know that it is absolute torture on earth. So if the universe was unkind to me, it is then up to me to be kind to others and to not fall into that cycle of hatred. Because if you do, not only do you become a monster in a sense, because now you are a disservice to society, but worse than that, you become a victim of your fate. Because now you are no longer in control. You are literally allowing the universe and others to shape you. And in this case, we could talk about odium fati, which is a concept I made up. It's the opposite of amor fati. So instead of accepting and loving one's fate, you reject and you hate your own fate, which then leads to the hatred of life itself that escalates into life denying behaviors that ultimately make you throw your life away. And to connect it again to a tangible example, we can look at people who have bad genetics. Usually these types who then jump on drugs do it because they think they're fixing an injustice. Life has not been fair to them. They reject the fate that life offered and they're going to carve their own path. They're going to hack the system. But the issue is that even though technically they have a valid justification for their action, the result of this, this rage against unfairness is only negative for them because deep down the thing that they did is they rejected life. Because the solution of injecting PEDs is not going to make you happier and it's not fixing shit. You're not going to fix your genetics. You're now injecting genetics and you now become dependent on them for the rest of your life. And that rest of your life won't be very long because the action of taking PDs itself is a life denying action. Now, a lot of people would like to excuse that away by talking about circumstances. And I perfectly agree that your life circumstances of course play a role. It's very easy to not fall into drugs when you have a very healthy childhood with both parents in a good neighborhood. That being said, in the story of Baki, what's interesting is that, as I said, both Jack and Baki have extremely similar circumstances. So they both had no moms, quote unquote, they had no dads, and they also had unfav unfavorable genetics, at least at the start. So Jack was skinny and Baki was extremely small. But all of that really shows that the only real difference between Baki and Jack was the decisions that they made. It was the choices that they made. Because in a parallel universe, Baki jumped on PEDs to make up for his lack of height and Jack stayed natural and figured out a way to train like a normal person and he became much, much stronger without having to resort to steroids. Now, what's fascinating is that these choices themselves were also the result of an environment. But this time it was one that they selected for themselves. Because at some point, even though they started at the same she level, they had a choice to make and that choice was, who do you want to surround yourself with? Baki, his entire story arc, 
is in reality the story of a boy who makes friends. Yeah, sure, they kick the shit out of each other and he fights a giant monkey, but that's what it's all about. It's about brotherhood and friendship. So he befriends the Yasha ape, he befriends Anayama, and all of that results to him understanding the value of brotherhood. Understanding that deep down the reason why he fights is also for that. It's also to make connections with people. It's not a sociopathic tendency to crush people down to see their blood. That's what Yujiro does, but Baki is entirely different. Jack, on the other hand, is, as I said, mostly alone. He has no friends whatsoever and he spends his entire journey trying to get stronger for that revenge fantasy he has but he never meets anyone along the way that could open his eyes to the true nature of, his, of this existence, which is love. I know it's cheesy as fuck to say, but that's the reason why you're put on this earth. It's to make connections. It's to love people, to create a family of your own choosing. That is the story of Baki. It's a boy who realizes that Yujiro is not actually his dad because he's a shitty fucking biological parent, but he's not stuck with him. He has the choice to create his own family with the friends that he picked for himself. Jack, on the other hand, was recuperated by this, like, scientist, and our relationship was one of Frankenstein and Frankenstein's creature. And that's something that Itagaki even adds to the story. Well, Jack says that he's perfectly fine being Frankenstein's creature. But if you have read Marie Shelley's Frankenstein, you know that the relationship between the creature and the doctor is one between someone who is technically a surrogate parent for the creature because it's his baby and the creature that only wants to be loved and he's being pushed away by that father and by humanity that rejects him. So at the end of the day, the real monster in the story is not the golem, it is the person that created him. And this is why in the story of Baki, the scientist kills himself because he realizes, he realizes what he's done. He realizes that he unleashed a monster onto Tokyo, but most importantly that he also robbed Jack of his existence and of potential happiness. Which is heartbreaking because if you have read the OG Baki story, you know that Jack is kind. The Anmas, the kids at least, are kind by nature. And it's horrible to see that both of them were forced to go against that nature and to turn into monsters in order to find their way through existence because Yujiro literally groomed them to do that and that the only one who managed to save himself from this toxic father-son relationship was Baki. Jack was never able to free himself. And so he spiraled into more and more self-destructive behaviors, which again is very easy when you're alone. The type of people who suffer from mental illness and heavy drug use as a result are also the types that have no one to talk to, they have no one to check them and they have no one to extend the hand. And this is why healthy masculinity as a concept is first and foremost community driven. It's about being a community of men because masculinity in a vacuum and for itself means absolutely nothing. Masculinity is only useful in relation to other people. And this is why the lone wolf masculinity trope is pathological. It's a pathological behavior. It's a perversion of what true masculinity is supposed to be because it deviates from the standard that has been established for thousands of years. And this is also exemplified in Baki because Baki is also a story about masculinity, about all these masculine role models that fight with one another in order to become better. But they're not just meatheads who want to prove that they have the biggest biceps, they are also people who have friends and who have families that they love. So if you look at Dopo, Dopo has an adoptive son, Dopo has a wife that he loves a ton, and if you know, the wife calls him what? My Superman. So you also have this relationship where the woman is in awe about the strength of the man, and the man tries to keep up that strength in order to keep her happy and safe. We also see an extreme case of that with Biscuit Oliva. Biscuit Oliva is madly in love, some would say he's simping for his wife, who is morbidly obese, but it doesn't matter, that is the source of his strength. The reason why Oliva is so buff, that is stated in the story, is because he wants to be able to carry her around. So masculinity and the strength that emerges from it is never selfish, it's never for oneself. It's always for the sake of someone else, and that is how you keep it healthy. 
when it becomes unhealthy and toxic is when that strength becomes something that is utilized for one's own sake only and when it is utilized to hurt innocent people. You'll also have noticed that all of the good guys in Baki never hurt innocents. The evil ones, however, the Ujiros and the convicts, kill people indiscriminately. They don't care who they have to fight, they don't care who they kill, as long as they can satisfy their own selfish urges. So in a sense, in Baki, you have a very strong subtext between actual orderly behavior, masculine behavior that benefits society, and psychopathic slash antisocial tendencies that lead to society going to shit because now masculinity is chaotic and it hurts people regardless of who they are for no reason whatsoever. You also notice that of course all of the evil archetypes of men in Baki are lone wolves, Yujiro has no friends save for Major Streetum, he's always by himself, the convicts are always by themselves, they are said to have no family left, no remaining family left. So this is a lesson by Itagaki that tells you that strength in itself is not enough, you also have to have people to use that strength for. And for those of you wondering, it's also the reason why, and I know people make fun of it because they think it's nonsensical or funny, Baki, when he has sex with Kozue, becomes stronger. It's symbolical. It symbolizes that now that he has a woman, he has a use for his strength, and so his strength is multiplied as a result because the strength of a man is first and foremost found in his relationships. Yujiro, if you have noticed, is only presented as a creature. He's never defined as a man because he is not. And in a sense, this relationship between masculinity and society also applies to Jack because if you paid attention, you know that he did all of that, all of the drug use, all of the fighting, to avenge his mom. But the issue is that ultimately, this was still selfish because if you think about it, his mom would have never wanted him to do that. Why would his mom want him to sacrifice his life just to get revenge when she's already dead. This made no sense whatsoever, and again, it's entirely life-denying. But the thing is that to be able to understand that, Jack would have needed to be able to get or to experience himself the good sides of life. It's very easy to reject life when you think that life is only suffering and cruelty. Now you think that you're not actually losing anything. So while Baki had many examples of friends and family that showed him love and therefore also taught him the right reasons to live, Jack never had that, so it was very easy for him to embrace nihilism as a mean of existing because he could not find any other reason to live his life save for revenge. And paradoxically, it's also what's, what makes him so cool. The revenge type character, the avenger, the punisher type character, appeals to young men for that reason, because we have a tendency to romanticize this type of reckless behavior. But it also goes deeper than that, in my opinion. I think that because humans are so intrinsically attached to survival, any type of behavior that rejects that notion and seeks death instead also appears super cool because it looks badass. This is why the kid on the motorcycle that refuses to put the helmet on is the cool kid. This is why the kid who smokes cigarettes in middle school is the cool kid. Because these are all behaviors that bring you closer to death and so show that you are in a sense brave because you're not afraid of it. And in psychological terms, this is known as the death drive. It's something that Freud uh, actually theorized himself. In French, we call that la pulsion de mort. In Greek, thanatos, I believe. And that pulsion de mort, that death drive, dictates that beings, individuals, have a tendency to express themselves through self-destructive behaviors when there is nothing else available. So, someone who sees no value in life will still, in a sense, try to live life. But the way they will do it as an organism will be by seeking out activities that eventually cause the demise of the organism. And while this theory has been heavily criticized because, of course, it can also be misused, I think that it holds some weight because there are many behaviors within human society that you can literally not explain if not via the dev drive. So many behaviors where individuals engage in activities that are clear net negatives in their lives, if you think about it logically, 
but who ultimately end up being better than nothing because if we accept that humans are first and foremost driven by a will, then that will, will apply to anything as long as that thing is an activity. So even an activity that is nefarious for the self will still be better than nothing. And so this is where you see people who do hard drugs, even though, yes, it will kill them, but they'll do it anyways because this is what they do now. It has become almost their identity and it is also a trait that I've noticed with PD users where the action of taking drugs becomes the center of their personality to the point where you wonder, are you doing bodybuilding because you enjoy the sport and the action of bodybuilding? Or are you doing it as an excuse because it justifies your drug use? Now, the thing is that usually PDUs are not aware of that. They, they, they lack the ability to introspect. And so they are étranger to eux-mêmes. I'm starting to mix French and English. Things are going south. What I mean is that they don't even know themselves. But with Jack, it's not the case. Jack is perfectly self-aware because throughout the story, times and times again, he openly says that, yes, he is dying. Yes, the behaviors he engages in get him closer to death. And he's perfectly okay with that. Actually, he embraces it. And that's not normal because it also directly goes again the will, against the will to survival. Every human being is attached to their own survival. PD users go against it, but you rarely hear them verbalize it. You rarely hear PD users say, yes, I don't give a fuck about my health or my life, and I am willing to die as soon as possible. The only people I've ever heard say that are teenagers who think they're being edgy. Even suicidal people usually don't verbalize it because it's so hard as a person to face the thought that you're actively speeding towards your own death. It's almost an impossibility. Most of the time, people who are slowly killing themselves lie to themselves. It's the only way they can justify that behavior. And this is why you will see a lot of PD users who display this badass, can't be broken mentality, which really serves as a front so as to not have to face their own mortality. And unfortunately, it's also this level of bravado that makes them extremely attractive in the eyes of young men, because young men see this delusion and they mistake it for confidence. And that is reinforced by the fact that these dudes tend to not look the part. These are not people who are doing heroin. They're not 40 pounds shitting on themselves. They look muscular. And so they also possess the appearance of vitality. And since our modern understanding of masculinity is mostly surface level and it's superficial, meaning that we tend to associate it with stuff like physical strength or like muscles, which makes tons of sense, but that's not what masculinity is all about at all. We also then tend to confuse these PD types with the paragon of masculinity because they have the confidence, they have the muscle, they have the aggression. So they have every visible physical trait that you would think a masculine man would possess. But the issue is that these traits do not reflect what is inside. But since we see none of that and we only see the good things, it's very easy to idolize these types and to want to take PEDs because until you experience it yourself, you will never know how much it sucks. And of course, if you ask PED users, the majority of them will not be honest. If anything, they're going to try and flip the script on you by pretending to be living life to the fullest, which is entirely nonsensical because as we've established, taking drugs is the exact opposite of that. You're rushing towards your own death. But as I explained, it's a needed mechanism because the man who is slowly killing himself cannot face that fact or else he would stop the behavior. But if you need the behavior to continue to satisfy your own ego, you need to find a way to keep it going. And that also leads to a bunch of in-group behaviors that PD users tend to embody that oftentimes resemble a form of morality. Because since there is no tangible moral background and backbone to PD use, these people have to find a reason to explain why they're still superior to people who are staying natural. And since logically the morality aspect is on the side of people who do stay natural, they cannot function by following this type of morality. So what they do is they come up with their own. And this is what I call these in-group behaviors that also serve as moral values. And these moral values articulate themselves 
around the positive and the negative aspects of the addiction, and it doesn't really matter which ones. That's the beauty of it too. Even someone as bad as your health deteriorating, PD users will turn it into a positive by claiming, for example, that naturals are pussies because they're not willing to do whatever it takes. Translation, because you're not willing to die young and to take drugs, then you are weak as a man. You lack willpower. That is completely fucking backwards, but it's something I've heard a million times. Now, for anyone with a shred of awareness, this appears what it is, which is a defense mechanism to not have to face the fact that these people are actively dying. But you have to keep in mind that even something as blatant is still ongoing today. And this is the reason why bodybuilding nowadays is a death court and is no longer something that is healthy. Because we moved from a sport that was originally life-affirming with natural bodybuilding, where you get muscle, you get strength, but you also live longer and in better health, to a life-denying practice that is now pro-bodybuilding, where you're going to die at the age of 40 because you attempted to access more vitality faster, so all of the things that natural bodybuilding were already giving you, but you do it via an unnatural mean, namely steroids, and so now you ruined the entire thing. And this is why I think that looking at the reasons that push people to take PEDs is so important. Because if we only were to look at the consequences, we would never understand why people would do such things. Why would you risk your health? Well, you would risk your health if you wanted more confidence, if you wanted more muscle, if you wanted more vitality. The problem is, the methods that you use to access these things will be the difference maker at the end of the day. But if you attempt to look at these motivations through the scope of morality, your own morality, that of a natural lifter, you'll never be able to understand that. Meaning also that the day these temptations knock on your door, you're going to be wholly unprepared because you never put yourself in the shoes of someone who would have faltered and who would have allowed these desires to win. With morality, you have to understand one thing. People will always abide by it until it clashes with their desire. The day it does, what they'll do is, they'll just come up with a new morality that doesn't, that justifies their choices and that allows them to give in to their desires. And this also applies to individuals that refuse to follow morality simply to be contrarian. And there are many of these types in society because it's extremely tempting to go against what society deems proper for the sake of feeling special or just because you do not like authority. And Jack is also written as a character that is anti-authority, which is also extremely appealing to young men. Now, the reason why Jack does it is also perfectly logical. If you are the type of person who suffers at the hand of a system, let's say capitalism, you're very unlikely to like that system. Why would you enjoy a set of rules where you constantly lose? You're going to want to destroy that set of rules and replace it with a set that allows you to win. And that is also something that people who are well integrated in society tend to not be able to understand. And also why I like Dostoevsky as an author, because he had a very uncanny ability to paint both sides, to paint the people who profit from the system and the people who don't. And he doesn't demonize the people who don't, he paints them for what they are. They're human beings who are trying to finical, who are trying to weasel their way out of an existence that doesn't fit what they want. And I'm not claiming by this that Jack is a character that would be worthy of Dostoevsky's writing because his morality is actually quite simplistic. He's following a simple might makes right morality where he just seeks more strength for the sake of revenge. So as I said, he is exactly like Yujiro in that aspect. And this also makes him an archetype of the Ubermensch because he's not only strong, but he also makes his own moral code and he lives by that code. He doesn't give a fuck about what other people have to say about it or think. Now, where a lot of people get it wrong is that some people think that being a Ubermensch is always good and they lose sight of the fact that Nietzsche clearly stated that his philosophy took place beyond good and evil. What he meant by it is that being a Ubermensch does not mean being well aligned with society or being a good person. It just means that you have your own set of rules and you don't let the hood dictate how you behave. That could lead to you becoming a serial killer. 
You could become a horrible person. You could also become someone who uses their strength to help others, but that is entirely up to you. So, both Baki and Jack are Ubermensch, but they took entirely different paths. One is a Dionysian Ubermensch, and the other is an Apollonian Ubermensch. What matters at this point, once we accept that, is where does this lead them both? Where does Baki moral code lead him, and where does Jack's moral code lead him? Well, with Baki, we see that he follows healthy self-improvement, he embraced love over hatred, and at the end, he manages to become the strongest fighter, but more importantly, someone with good mental health and someone who is deeply happy. Jack, on the other hand, almost lost his life at the end of the arc. He never avenged his mom, he never managed to make peace with his mom's death, and he never managed to salvage, salvage his relationship with Yujiro. So ultimately, the person who embraced life-affirming philosophies and tendencies had a happy life, and the person who embraced life-denying ideologies had a shit life. It is not surprising, but what matters is to look at the path they took so as to make sure that we don't make the same mistakes. And the cherry on top of all of this is that, technically, Jack should have died. Because during his fight with Baki, he overdoses on steroids and he is supposed to just, just pass out right there and then. But he doesn't, of, he doesn't off of a technicality because his body magically rejects steroids. So now in the story of Baki, it's all nice and well, it's a deus ex machina. But we have to keep in mind that Baki is a story, it's fiction. In the real world, Jack dies. The life that Jack elected to follow for himself directly led to a very early death. Because if you decide to ignore tomorrow and pretend it doesn't exist, likely there will come a point where you will not get a tomorrow anymore. And that is the life that the majority of influencers on drugs choose. They might not be able to accept it to themselves, but that is a fact. The difference being that one day, for them, the price to pay and the consequences will be real. It won't be a fucking fiction. It won't be you close the book and you can go back to your life. You have one existence. You have one body and you have one set of organs. Once you fuck it up, that's it. Rideau, as we say in French. End of the representation. We all go home. And I know it's very easy to tell yourself that you're going to be okay because you're young and when we're young, we feel invincible. But the horrible thing about death is that once it knocks on your door, it's not going away. You can't ask for an extra day or an extra week. It's there and it claims you right now. As one of my favorite quotes say, no man can walk out of his own story. So if you decide that your life is going to be a tragedy, you better be ready for the day where the conclusion of that tragedy occurs because at this point, it will be too late for regrets. And this is what makes Jack such a great role model because he's an over-exaggerated and absurd caricature of a drug user whose extreme behavior forces you and I to face your temptations and question our roots before it is too late. So, in a sense, it's very similar to Guts. I made a similar video talking about Guts and his trauma and the fact that the character of Guts in Berserk serves as a mirror for the reader to question their own relationship to trauma and the means they're putting in place to get better before the Beast of Darkness claims you and makes you hurt the people that you love. And if you're interested, that video is also in the description. And Jack's lesson is that his heart was in the right place but his mindset was out of whack. And it's hard to judge him for that given his circumstances. But at the end of the day, your circumstances don't matter. You are responsible for your own happiness and you are responsible for your own future. And as a story that functions as a warning against nihilism and how quickly it can take over our lives, I think that Jack's story arc gets that point across beautifully. Because the antidote to these life-denying behaviors is gratitude. The gratitude of having been born in a sound and healthy body. As long as you have that, you are the luckiest man on the planet. And it is on these wise words that I'm going to be concluding this video. 
If you enjoyed this philosophical segment and you want to see more, you can support the channel. It's the first link in the description. It's my coffee page. You can pledge, you can donate. Anything is appreciated and allows me to spend a lot of time on these videos. For the next episode of this series, we'll be back to covering Berserk because there are still a lot of subjects I haven't touched on yet. But I will be that for today. Thank you for watching and have a good night.